Last year, I got to do a, a quick attendee talk about the process of um, starting uh, the, the business and, and sort of my experience of being on the sidelines and what it, what it was like to have those conversations about, like, really, you're going to leave your job and, and what exactly you're going to do and how will we, you know, pay the mortgage? Um, and so it's nice to be on the other side of that a little bit. And so my talk today is more about the long term, thinking about how to make this work, not just for the adrenaline-filled early years, but for, the, you know, for your life, for the duration of how long you want it to work, how long you want this to be, um, sort of live the founder life. And my job, I think at this point, is to shift your focus a little bit. I know that you are probably at saturation point with great ideas about how to build your app to ensure the success of your company and the tools that you're building. So let's let those neuronal connections sort of solidify a little bit and shift our attention. And the thing that I would like you to think about is, in my opinion, probably the most important resource that you're bringing to your startup. And that is what? Your own mind, yourself. That if you are not well in your mind, the rest of it doesn't really matter. We know that a founder's life is, a, is actually a very difficult life. There's some great research that looks at the relationship between anxiety and founders, and that founders, entrepreneurs in general, founders specifically, have higher rates of anxiety than their kind of nine to five compadres. There's also the risk of isolation, especially among those of you who are doing solo startups. You're living in this world in your head all by yourself. And it can be hard to feel like people get you. They understand what's happening. And although there's wonderful creativity in the ability to make and do something yourself, there's also a shadow side. There's the real reality of isolation, of feeling alone in this venture that's really important to you. We also know that you are taking on a great deal of risk that makes you vulnerable. No one else is going to sign your paycheck. Once you commit to doing this, you commit to taking on the risk of making, making it, of making it work. And however you talk yourself through that, you have to realize you're sort of outrunning this demon of vulnerability, of financial vulnerability, of isolation. There's also the real risk of failure, that many of these startups fail. And that will keep you awake at night. What do you do with that thought? How do you cope with it? And what does it mean about you if you fail? Is it sort of a global failure of your humanness, yourself as a person? Or have you figured out ways to talk to yourself about the reality of failure that don't involve so much shame? Because shame is a killer emotion. It makes sense to feel bad if you fail, to be stressed, to be worried, to you know, really mourn the loss of your time and your energy. But shame is a different feeling. Shame is the sense of I am bad. I am worthless. I am a failure, not the behavior I failed. See the distinction? It's an important one. And as many of you have already talked about, there's a lot of blurred lines in the life of a founder. Is it work time? Is it family time? Many of, of you are working from home and are trying to sort of figure out how to take care of kids or be present with your spouses while also working and doing everything at once, sometimes crammed into very small amounts of time. So the successes are fantastic, and this is a great life. But the realities are also that it's very hard and that there are some real downsides to pay attention to and to not run from. And I'm certainly not the one or the only one who is working to make this point. As Mike talked about, there was a great talk at Business of Software about depression in founders that Greg Burgess did. I'm not sure if I'm saying his name correctly. There's also been 
a lot of interest in the role of mental health and the psychological toll of entrepreneurship, probably in large part to the, the tragic deaths of Aaron Schwartz and uh, Dana Sherman, right? Okay, I'm sorry. So these are very different conversations than what we've been having all day, but they're important conversations, important things to think about. There is this complicated relationship between mental illness and creative, out-of-the-box kinds of people. So some of you have been drawn to founding or starting your own company because there are certain things about you that make it hard for you or make it not a fit for you to stay in that nine to five corporate world. So things like hypomania, attention problems, depression, things that we would probably qualify as mental illness, but actually make you well suited to be a founder. So there may be sort of a self-selecting bias in this group of people who are starting their own companies toward some things like anxiety, depression, other things we categorize as mental illness. I like this quote from Jason Kalkanis. I've always believed that being a founder is an unhealthy pursuit at times, and few have disagreed. Certainly not those who have done it. Read any biography of a successful founder, and you'll find collateral damage around and certainly in those individuals. And so what my talk is really about today is how do we minimize this collateral damage? How do we honestly acknowledge what is and what can go wrong? How do we take our own health seriously? And how do we take action before the spiral reaches the bottom? This is my code book. This is the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It makes for a great late night reading. Um, but it is the, the textbook that categorizes everything that we quantify as mental illness. And uh, in a little book, a lovely little book called How to Stay Sane, an author named Philippa Perry made this great observation about the diagnoses included in this textbook. She argued that the things that we talk about as mental illness can sort of be thought of on a spectrum as disruption towards chaos or disruption towards rigidity. So chaos and rigidity. And that when we think about what goes wrong with human functioning, we're often somewhere in this spectrum between chaos and rigidity. So what does that mean for us? You don't have to qualify for a mental illness to sort of be on one end of this spectrum. Chaos is this picture of a person whose life is kind of all over the place. They are maybe highly distracted. They're doing 18 things at once. It's difficult for them to focus. This may be somebody who's dabbling without shipping or working on multiple projects on one time, at one time without like a clear path or sense of success for the app that they're focused on. This is sort of a go, go, go collapse mentality. And it may be somebody who really doesn't kind of know their own mind, isn't really comfortable in their own skin, is maybe kind of working out their own family history, their father issues or their mother issues. They're trying to prove something. But the angst with which they're doing it keeps them from really focusing with much depth or clarity on what they're doing. So again, the behavior here is pretty impulsive and disorganized. And it may come with these incomplete thoughts. Um, I just have to build a few more features before I ship. Or I can't ship, it's not good enough yet. Or comparing themselves, I wonder what uh, Rob Walling is doing. Trying to work something out, trying to make it better, never feeling like it's good enough but also like, not really paying attention to data, not thinking clearly about how they know when it's time to finish something. 
The emotional part of this chaoticness is the sense in which we are our feelings. Our feelings define us. Our feelings define our decisions. What we feel must be true. And I don't know about you, but most of us have feelings that go up and down quite a bit. Every microcomp, Rob says, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> Probably especially today. I'm never doing this again. But thankfully, that's one feeling, and it fits in a larger context of feelings. But to be chaotic is somebody who has that thought or that feeling, I'm never doing this again, and then actually acts on that, but without considering the larger context of the situation or the larger context of how they're doing. Some of you have experienced monkey mind, where your mind is bouncing all over the place and you're struggling to focus. You might have your, um, you know, you're, you're texting with someone, you're chatting with someone, and you're trying to code and work and you're watching a child at the same time, all over the place. It can be part of this chaotic sort of way of being. Some of us have life-induced chaos. There are evenings where Rob and I struggle to finish a sentence because of the busyness of our home and our lives. And that's fine on some evenings, but when that's your larger life pattern, and it's hard to be present or to have much depth with anything, any one thing, because you're too fragmented, you're too all over the place, you're starting to sort of tip in that direction of being not well, not okay, not thriving. Does this sound like anybody you know? Sort of chaotic, no? Rigidity is the other end of this spectrum. So this is the uh, lack of flexibility. Lack of thinking outside the box, of trying over and over to make something work in the same way, because maybe it worked that way at one time, but not integrating new information. Maybe ignoring the big picture. Maybe feeling like you have to stay in the lines to be successful. It's sort of an outdated, rigid way of responding to the world. And you might see sort of repetitive, inflexible actions. And these are, these are red flag words for rigidity. Always, never, must, should. When you find yourself thinking that way or saying those words, you have to do a little double check. Am I, am I being rigid? Am I being too rigid here? This is never going to work. I am wasting my time. Nothing I do, I'm always going to be a failure. I'm not as smart as Heat and Shaw. Few of us are. Fear dictates decisions. You're also doing a lot of black and white thinking. It has to be this way or that way, this or that. And that's rarely true. There's often a lot of middle ground. The other thing that you might find yourself doing if you're a little bit kicked on the rigid side of the spectrum is catastrophic if-then statements. If this email blast is not well received, my startup will certainly fail and my wife will leave me and my kids will hate me and you know, my life is just over at that point. And I'm being a little bit lighthearted, but the reality is that we do think like this, right? There are moments where we think, if then, if this doesn't go the way that I want it to, then there will be severe catastrophic consequences. And again, those things are rarely really true but we find ourselves thinking that way when we're struggling to control or especially when we are afraid. Fear is kind of the primary um, driver behind rigidity. It's the, the desire to control external variables. It's the fear of the unknown, the fear of what you can't control. And it can be a dangerous place to live. We all go there sometimes, for sure. But if you're living there, if you're there all the time, if that's your default way of approaching the world, then you, know, you might really want to ask yourself, like, am I okay? 
Am I, am I who I want to be? Or am I not well? So the question, the challenge that many of us face is finding balance. Finding balance between chaos and rigidity. Finding balance to sort of be and do the things that we, who we want to be. And I like to talk about this in sort of two ways. Taking time out and taking time in. So I'm going to throw at you a bunch of ideas of things to implement or strategies to sort of pursue your own personal well-being. And um, some of them will be perfect for you, and some of them won't matter so, or won't be applicable to you. So we'll just sort of, you sort of take what's useful. So when we think about time out, what we're looking for is a change of perspective. And I think timeouts are really helpful for those of us who run a little rigid, who are pretty stuck in our ways of thinking. To take a time out is to step outside of those well-worn patterns and to do something else, to think about something else. So Mike sort of set me up, thanks Mike, for the bump set spike here. Sleep is a really, really important way to take a time out. We'll say more about that in a second. But also things like exercise and nutrition. These are the three. Mike and I didn't coordinate our talks. But these are the three that are really essential if you want your brain to function well. You really have to have um, some dedicated attention to taking care of these three parts of your life. Another one is play. Really taking time out to have fun, to play with your children, to go on vacation, to have a hobby, to be something more than your app. You have to be able to be something more than your app. I'm a big fan also of taking breaks from screens, from these wonderful magic devices that, makes our, that make our lives better, but we can really kind of forget how to sit eye to eye with someone or how to be in a place without like having a constant stream of news and information always stimulating us. What we want when we're taking a time out is to let our brain do something different, to let it practice some different pathways and to let it be still, to have a change of pace and a change of content. So taking breaks from screens can be a great way to do that. And that can be one day a week, or just one evening at dinner, or making sure that you're building in spaces in your lives where you're not always plugged in. I'm a big fan of travel for changing the perspective. If you feel so rigid and so kind of a slave to your app, it might be time to sort of do and see things that are very different to recharge your ability to take in information from your environment, to enjoy novelty, new sights and new smells, and to understand that the world is big. And although what you're working on is so important and you should love it and enjoy it, you want to put it in its proper place in your life and in the world of what's important to you. Another way to take a time out is to serve, to spend one day every six months helping with a shoe drive or feeding people at your local homeless shelter. And there's really great research that supports the importance of service in terms of continuing flexible thinking and also overall life satisfaction. So to realize that even though you might be struggling in what you're doing with your app, that, that you have a, a sort of a role to play in helping the well-being of another person. And it helps you realize that, again, you're bigger than this project that you're working on. There's more to you. There's more going on. And the other part of service is that it kind of, again, puts your experience in a larger context. And it's not about feeling guilty for what you have or what you're doing, but it is about realizing that Again, there's a great big world out there, and people struggle with all kinds of different things. And it might actually make you kind of grateful for the thing that you're struggling with, because it's kind of a privilege to be able to do this kind of work and to be um, your own boss and to um, be creative and be able to do the kinds of things that you're doing. So again, it just helps put things in perspective. I want to say a little bit more about sleep. 
And Mike um, gave you some great information. Sorry, this is taking a long time about some of the research behind sleep and the importance of sleep in terms of maintaining your fitness, your anxiety level. Sleep might be the single most important behavioral activity that we do in our day. Not only does it help keep us healthy, it also, especially for you all in this room, it is a time when your brain is incredibly active. Your brain is often more active during sleep than it is when you're awake. So your brain is working on memory consolidation. It's sort of reviewing the day and taking information that you have taken in in your day, and it's helping to solidify the neural pathways that help you remember that data. It also, we think, some new research suggests that your brain is working on complex problems while you're sleeping. So your brain might be doing a lot of the work to solve the kinds of things that you're having trouble solving when you're awake. Your brain is working on it when you're asleep. So if you're not sleeping well, you're definitely not functioning to your optimal level in your app. You know, you're not able to really do the kinds of complex problem solving that you need to do to be successful. There's a great TED Talk about sleep that if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's Dr. Russell Foster, and the title is Why Do We Sleep? And it's, you know, TED Talk's 12 minutes or something that will give you great information about what the role that sleep plays in your life and how important it is to you. So another part of taking a time out or resetting what's happening in your body and in your mind is simply breathing. When you're stressed, when you're anxious, your body is sort of triggering this whole hormonal, muscular, chemical response cycle that is designed to help you in the short term, but over the long term can be very dangerous to you. And one of the things that is so powerful and important to being able to control stress and anxiety is simply to breathe. I know, it sounds really simple. But to be able to do this well is a very powerful way to interrupt the feedback loop between your mind and your body, where your mind is telling your body that it's worried and your body is responding to try to respond to the anxiety and the worry that your mind is giving, but you're kind of creating this mess between your mind and your body where everybody's anxious and worked up. So if you can interrupt that pattern, then you can refocus your mind and have this sort of very powerful sense of ability to control your own anxiety. So I thought we'd get a little experiential here. You wanna wanna try, try it? You up for that? Okay, so I'm gonna kind of walk you through how to do this how to breathe, how to control your anxiety through breath. So the first thing is um, kind of resettle maybe how you're sitting in your chair so that your back is against the back of your chair and your feet are flat on the floor. Okay. If you can, you might want to lower your screen. It's okay, you can, you can bring it back up later. It'll be all right. Put your hands on your, kind of on your lower abdomen. And what I would like you to do is when you take a breath in, think about where the air is going. So sort of in through your nostrils, down through the center of your body, and you want the air to actually fill your stomach, fill your abdomen, and you want to feel it moving. So let's try it all together. Let's take a breath in. You feel your stomach moving. And then as you exhale, you should feel your stomach contract. So one way to do this is to close your eyes if you feel comfortable doing so. Leave, kind of leave your hands relaxed on your stomach. And take a breath in for four counts. So as you breathe in, count one, two, three, four, and breathe out. One, two, 
three, four. Do that again. As you inhale, breathing in, breathe in calm, peace, relaxation. And breathe out anxiety, fear, stress, worry. And as you breathe in again, picture a place where you feel comfortable, happy, safe, the beach, the mountains, your comfy chair in your living room. And as you breathe out, settle into that place. Feel your body kind of relaxing in that place. On your next inhalation, stay there, stay in that place where you feel safe, comfortable, calm. Feel it filling you as your abdomen is filled with oxygen. And then exhale, let yourself be there. We'll take one more breath together. As you breathe in, think about oxygen. It's nourishing, it's life-giving. Your cells need it, you desperately need it. And as you exhale, releasing the carbon dioxide that isn't useful to you anymore. You can release it, get it out of your body, it's waste. So go ahead and come back to this room. Open your eyes if you've closed them. Anybody feel a little bit more relaxed than they did before? Yeah. So even four breaths like that, four, four by four, four seconds in, four seconds out, four times, even something as simple as that can help stop the anxiety cycle, can be a little mini timeout where you let your body relax so your mind can focus. Your mind can have a different experience. So I definitely don't want to communicate that the only way to do this well and to be healthy as a founder is to take time away, because that's not the reality, right? Sometimes what's needed is time in, in a deeper, more intentional way. And this may be the case if you're, if you're someone who runs a little chaotic and you find it hard to focus. Specific ways of thinking about how to engage your work in an, an intentional and an alert way, focus time in. Organizing your time. Last year when I was with you, I talked about our, our Sunday night huddle that Rob and I do to try to figure out our life. Who's going where, when, who's working when, who's got the kids, who's, like, it's the map of what's going on. And so I know that on Friday mornings for four hours, I have a solid block of uninterrupted time to do whatever I'm doing, to work on a talk, to do some writing, whatever it, it is that I need focused time for. And you might want to carve out those times in your own schedule. When is my specific time to do this one thing? This, the time when I always record my podcast or always work on my blog, and it's just sacrosanct. It's specific, it's focused, and you're not going to have distractions during that time. You might not be able to do that for everything you'd like to do it for, but that's when you have to prioritize what are you going to focus on? What are you going to put your time into? Another thing that is great in terms of a time in kind of focus is coming to conferences. Giving yourself time and space to learn, to get new ideas, to be around colleagues to take time away from your normal schedule, to put time in to thinking about the bigger picture of how you do your app or your business. Another way to do this in an even deeper, more specific way is through masterminds. I'm also gonna talk a little bit about personal metrics and retreats. 
So masterminds, to say a little bit more about these, I get it. You're all individual. You want to be autonomous. You want to be a solo founder. You want to do it on your own. You want to bootstrap. Fabulous. You actually can't do that by yourself. That you, all of us, need others. We need feedback about how we're doing, what we're doing well. I read a study that talked about um, the role of mentors and role models for successful entrepreneurs. And I guess something like 54% of successful entrepreneurs had a specific role model or mentor or someone that they talked with about their business idea. And of those people who used a role model, 30% of that group said that they couldn't have been successful in their startup without their role model. So having people who can give you ideas and feedback about what you're doing and answer some tough questions for you. Who are your role models? Who can help you find balance? Who can give you feedback about like, wow, you're sounding really chaotic this week? Or you keep trying the same thing, expecting it to be different, but it's not different, so let's try something else. Can sort of help you gauge where you are on this chaos rigidity scale. And who do you trust to be part of your feedback loop? I'm sure most of you have heard the 10,000 hours statement, right? That it takes 10,000 hours to develop expertise or to become really excellent at something. There's actually a caveat to the research about that. 10,000 hours of practicing something the wrong way makes you really good at doing it wrong. The important thing about 10,000 hours is the feedback loop that goes with it. So if you're going to be um, a high-level athlete or professional musician, you need a coach or a teacher or a practice partner who can work with you during those 10,000 hours that you're putting in to say, you know, hold, it, hold your racket a little this way or make sure you get your bow up or make adjustments on the details of how you're doing your work. And that's the value of a mastermind. That's the value of a role model, of a mentor, that you need sort of these little specific tweaks that are very much about you and what you're doing, but are informed by someone who understands your app, understands your business, what you're trying to do, and understands who you are. So it's very specific, tailored feedback. It's different than what you would read in a book or get at a conference. It's much more personal. So I know things like the Founder Cafe are kind of moving in this direction to help make sure that people have the support of a mastermind group. I've also talked at times about the role that the mastermind group has played in Rob's life and therefore my life in that he has somebody to talk about the details and the ideas with that's not me because I'm actually not a founder and I actually want to talk about other things like our kids or what we're having for dinner. and so. To be able to go deep with someone who is committed to that conversation with you on a weekly basis or a monthly basis is an incredible asset to the success of your startup. So how many of you during this conference have checked your website metrics? Anybody? Yeah, OK. I saw you doing it. Um, <laughs> So you all pay a lot of attention, right, to what's happening with your site, to how many people are visiting it. Um, I know that you, well, we're going to hear a talk tomorrow all about metrics. But I guess I'm wondering how you track your personal metrics, how you know how you're doing, how you know what it's looking like inside your own head if you're well, if you're thriving, if you're performing in the way that you would like to, or if your inner world looks a little bit like this. How do you take time to sort of get inside your own brain? We call this metacognition, thinking about thinking, paying attention to how we're thinking and how we're doing in our own heads so that we don't look like this, so that our inner life looks a little more like this or this. Or my personal favorite, this. So what kind of data do you need to track on yourself? How do you know? How do you, what do you need to pay attention to to know whether you're doing OK? There's an old um, 
Ignatian practice called the examine, which simply invites people each day to ask, what was life giving today? What sucked life today? That's my own translation. What was my high point? What was my low point? Where did I feel flow? Where did I love my life today? And where didn't I? Those are very simple questions that can be answered in a fragment that you can track in a spreadsheet or in a journaling app. And they're really important pieces of data to help you know what you're actually enjoying. Because we are so good at tunnel down focus, at responding to the fires that we have to put out, at managing the tasks, that it's really easy to forget to actually ask, are we enjoying our life? Are we doing this well? So I'm a fan of recording a daily check-in. Another thing, if you are a writer kind of person, you might consider doing is keeping a journal. I know it, maybe it sounds a little like high school girl, but <laughs> keeping a journal has really strong research support in terms of immune functioning, lower blood pressure, life satisfaction, and stronger relationships. So it's one of those practices that, again, like breathing, is simple and obvious, but deeply powerful if you really commit to doing it. If you don't feel like you want to write kind of a dear diary thing every day, write one thing that you're grateful for each day, one thing that went well, that made you happy. Even paying attention to that metric can give you a good sense of what you're, sort of what you're responding to, what's working in your life. I think what helps or what happens when we dare to be self-observant, when we are working on becoming more self-aware, is that we are practicing telling our story. We're working on a positive personal narrative, a sense of who we are. We're telling our story all the time, but how are we telling it? Are we telling it through chaos? Are we telling it through rigidity? Or are we telling it in a way that talks about what we are loving and what we are doing and the great ideas and creativity that we're experiencing? So practice your story. Practice telling it. Practice thinking about it. And when you feel bad, or when you have the thought, I'm never doing microconf again, just observe it. Don't judge it. Emotions are momentary. They're temporary. They're really important information, but they're not... They don't embody the whole story about us. But if we collect them over time, then we have good information about decisions we need to make, directions we need to go. Get comfortable with your emotions, the good ones and the bad ones. Pay attention to them. Take them seriously. Another strategy, the last one that I'll talk about, for time in is a retreat. And Rob and I have been doing these yearly for a couple of years now. And it's become a really important and really powerful part of our lives. And I want to be clear that this is time in. It's not time out. This is not margaritas on the beach. That's a good thing, too. But that is a break from your work. A retreat is a very specific and focused time to think about some deeper questions in your work. We go for 48 hours or longer, so we try to spend two nights away. I should clarify, I'm speaking in the plural because we both do this, but we do this separately. We go by ourselves, not with the family, not with the kids. We need quiet, focused time. So it should be solitary. It should be screen-free if possible. I know it can be really difficult to be away from email for that long, so if you need to set aside part of your retreat time to do some email or put out fires or pay attention to things that can't go without your attention for two days, fine. But minimize other work that you're doing. Sometimes it's important to go in with a couple of specific questions, like, should I take on a partner? Should I sell my app? Should I... Um, you know, launch a new product this year. You're asking a big question, and you're going to sit with that big question for a couple days and record information about kind of what's coming up in your mind as you think about that big question. 
You can also use those examine questions on a retreat where you're basically asking, when I look over the last year of my life, what were my high points? What, were, what, what do I love? What do I want to do again? And what are my low points? What do I want to get rid of or eliminate from my life? You might also map out some personal and professional goals for a year. So it's a really, again, important way to keep data on yourself. What do I want? What do I love? What do I need to get out of my life because it sucks energy from me? And I think the last thing is that once, if you do this well, if you really go in and really think deeply, take it seriously and make decisions based on it. I went on a retreat uh, maybe three, four years ago, and I realized that all of the things that I disliked were about my university job working as a professor. I didn't like grading, I didn't like faculty meetings, I didn't like committees, and there were like 18 things that I didn't like that all had to do with my job. Well, guess what? <laughs> I quit my job. It was that clear to me when I looked at all of the information that this is not working. I am not doing well in this. And so it was really gratifying to go on a retreat the next year and see all of the things that I disliked last year are gone from my life. I don't have them anymore. Now you can't always do that because every once in a while I don't like something that's going on with my kids but I can't get rid of them. So <laughs> I have to like, you know, ask myself how can I how can I do this differently? This year I went on my retreat and I realized that a lot of my low points were about my kids and they were about how frustrated I were I am or I have been with certain parts of their lives or a dynamic together. And I realized I can't cope with what they're doing, but I need to be a little bit more proactive about what I'm doing, which means I'm, I'm irritable, I'm angry, I have a short temper. So I need to change things in my life so that I'm doing that better. So I rearranged my work schedule so that I can go to yoga three times a week and relax and take care of myself and have quiet time. And that simple change has made a really big difference in the amount of sort of tension in our home. And so if you go in and really think about these questions, it is time to make decisions. And you can change these factors in your life that are causing trouble. So when I do it, I go and I use a big piece of butcher paper and scribble all over it. And then I put it into a spreadsheet so that I can track it from year to year. Rob <laughs> uses a Moleskine notebook, which he takes so seriously, he had it tattooed on his arm, which is cool, good. Some people have their wife's name on their arm, but you have your notebook. It's good, whatever. All right. I think the bottom line is that um, we are imperfect beings, and we have great ideas, but we get snagged and we get snarled sometimes. Sometimes in chaos, sometimes in rigidity, sometimes in full-on, full-blown mental illness. And when we acknowledge that we're imperfect and that we don't always do it right and that we are going to fail and going to mess up, then I think we have all kinds of space to just simply ask, how do we do this better? How do we do this better? How do we live more the life that we want to live? One thing I want to say really quick this is the, the mental health professional in me. How do you know when you need help? When you have significant sleep disruption for a, a, you know, a couple of weeks to a month. When you're crossing the line. And this means when you scream at your child or you get a little rough with them or you snap at your wife in a way that really isn't okay. And you know that for you, it's not OK. You've crossed the line. And you're trying to figure out how to backpedal from that line. That might be a time that tells you you're not coping well. You need some help. A prolonged inability to focus or to shift your thoughts. Perseveration. The hamster wheel is going, and your mind is spinning on something. And despite all of your best efforts, you can't get out of it. That's a great time to get some help. The sense of I'm just not myself, and it stays with you for a, for a while, for a couple weeks or more. Or things like apathy, sadness, or flat mood, lack of mood, lack of feeling. 
that might be a time to get help. And then, of course, thoughts of self-harm or disregard for your own safety. Those are not uncommon thoughts. They're not uncommon feelings. But it's so important that you say something, that you see a therapist, you see your physician, you see your pastor, you see somebody, you talk with somebody, because we don't have to dwell in these kinds of feelings and experiences. I came home in January of 2013, and I found Rob in our home office, and he was crying. And I immediately thought, you know, where are the children, and are your parents okay, and what's going on? And he told me about the suicide of Aaron Schwartz. And his tears were not necessarily about Aaron specifically, in that we didn't know him, but the tears were for you guys. The tears were for our children, our sons, who are quirky and smart and idealistic and angsty sometimes. That for all of the people who have great potential and great creativity and great ideas, but who get sunk, who get overwhelmed, and who can't find their way out of it. And that's why I'm here, because there are really painful parts of this process. The failure is real, the challenges are real, but there are many, many ways to live a happy life. And if this is working for you, awesome. If it's not working for you, if you're suffering, if this is terrible on your heart and your relationships and your inner life, then do something different. I think the importance is that we're living well with the life that we have. So here's a bunch of resources to help you think about some of the topics that I've um, that I've raised, and I can make these available in a different format that will be easier to track down. But uh, I think my time is up. Thanks for your attention. Ooh. Um, this is not a question, but more of a comment. So about three months ago, I was diagnosed with high blood pressure and stage one kidney disease, and that was as a result of being stressed. So a few ways to avoid that. Um, a great app is called Couch to 5K, and it'll get you running on 5K in basically 10 weeks. Um, there's something called Analog Sunday, where basically you take Sunday off from all screens. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you've probably seen it on an info commercial, but it's called a Nutribullet. It's a way to get your veggies and fruit in a smoothie. So um, those are just a few tips that you can use if uh, you've got any issues. Fantastic. Thank you. We also practice screen-free Sundays, most Sundays. We play games and look at each other. It's, it's amazing. Wow. Hi. Eye to eye contact? Who does that? <laughs> um, I was wondering if you or actually anybody in the room know of resources for professionals to talk to who are familiar with entrepreneurial issues. Like, you know, I, I would love to you know, go through sometimes you need couples counseling right with my yeah. wife but i don't know if a if a kind of standard <laughs> uh therapist would deeply understand all the issues like you know the things that you you say you know about from going through with rob and stuff like that um a good therapist should be able to be helpful even if they don't kind of know the ins and outs of your particular story somebody that's well-trained, that you find trustworthy, and they seem to know what they're talking about, they are professional. Um, there is a new kind of think tank at, that's a partnership between UC San Francisco and UC Berkeley that is looking at entrepreneurial mental health. I think they're doing a lot of research. I don't know if they have a practice component. Um, so the, the answer really is no. I don't know of specialized programs that are really looking at treatment that's related to entrepreneurial mental health, but there are a lot of great practitioners out there who, you know, with, with a little bit of information, if you can help guide them, give them some resources, they should be able to get up to snuff pretty quickly. Unless others know of a specific or a specialized program, I don't, unfortunately.
When you do your 48 hour plus retreats, is that with you and your husband or is it strictly your, by yourself? It's by myself. Yeah, we both Ooh. go by ourselves. Yes. Right we it's like each fun. other, but <laughs> <laughs> it's the space to really not have to respond to anything or anyone else except what's happening in your own head. That's Thanks. kind of the importance of it. I'll give that a try. One issue I've always struggled with is like determining when something is just not working or that you haven't tried hard enough yet. Mm. And when's that line of when it's just not worth doing anymore or when it's just, um, just like I said, you're not tried hard enough yet. So. Yeah. I mean, I think in some ways, one of the ways that I would think about that decision is as you, if you actually are collecting kind of personal data and you realize that day in and day out, over and over for months, that's your source of frustration or that's your low point of your life, you might ask, like, do I really want to be doing this anymore? Um, is, or is it at a point where, you know, I have just put so much into this and it's no longer valuable to me? It's no longer worth it. So this is one way of thinking about that question. But I also think a mastermind is really helpful. Like people who understand what you're thinking about and what you're trying to do, if they're honest with you, if they're good at being kind of your thought partners, then they should be able to give you some honest feedback about like, okay, guy, it's just time. It's just time to do something else. Yeah. So first, fantastic talk. Um, yeah. But I have one comment or one like bit of... Um, something that we do in my family that's really started to work. We picked it up from my kid, actually, who picked it up at camp last year. And every night we sit around at the table for dinner, we do something called uh, Rose Thorn Bud. So you have to say, what's the best part of your day or what were the best parts of your day? What was the worst part of your day? And what are you looking forward to tomorrow? Wonderful. It's really good for keeping in sync, but it also puts perspective on, did you have a good day or was it not such a, much a good day? Yeah. And since we started doing it, we actually, if we go out to dinner and we can't do it or we're with family and everything, we actually do it in the car on the way home or like family dinners with big family and stuff. They actually want us to do it. They get ticked off when we forget <laughs> to do it. Um, my question to you though was about sleep. So how do you know how much sleep is good sleep? And then how do you know the type of sleep? I've, I've used those bands that say, you know, you're in deep sleep and you look like a roller coaster all mm -hmm. night. And then some nights you've got just one giant block that looks like someone just knocked you upside the head and you were out cold for six hours. <laughs> So how do you know, like, what, what, are you, what are you shooting for, for that kind of stuff? Um, well, there should be variability in your sleep. Um, you want to wake up feeling refreshed. I mean, that's one of the things that can sort of be your best predictor is how do you feel when you wake up? Another thing to look at is your tiredness level during, during the day. Do you feel like you have to have caffeine to fuel you? Or could you get by without that cup of coffee? That's one of the things where your body is sort of telling you how, how, um, how well rested it is. Another thing about sleep is, you know, some people will, will have, a, have a scotch before bed or, you know, will use alcohol to help calm down. And that works because alcohol is a sedative, but it doesn't work in the sense that it also sedates some of that brain functioning that's actually so important in sleep. So it's, it's not a good, I know that's not what you're asking, but it's not a good tool in, in terms of helping you to calm down to go to sleep. So one other thing that I love, though, about what you just said, the rose thorn rosebud, is that that practice, the, that third question of what are you looking forward to tomorrow, is so important because it reminds us that the way that we feel right now isn't the way we're going to feel forever. That if we look forward to tomorrow, we're realizing something new is coming, a new feeling is coming, a new experience is coming, which is really important. It took like two weeks to realize that that's the thing that we all enjoy Yeah. Great. Cool practice. All right, we have time for one more question, and I see a hand here. Sherry, thank you for a great talk. Uh, what would be your advice for those who are dealing with uh, situations that are not stable, that when you don't have like a defined schedule, like in my case that would be kids, that, but I imagine that would be like some aspect of client work of something else. How would you manage that? So when you have, when you have kids that you're trying to take care of and also respond to clients uh, who... We, 
when you are not uh, actually aware where or like when you're going to have working time or not, like yeah. when you can get things done or not, it's a big source of anxiety, I sure. imagine, for many people. Yeah. Um, well, I, tell me if I'm answering your question correctly or not, or if it makes sense. But, but one thing that, that we do is sort of to make it predictable by having childcare during certain hours when I know I'm not going to be responsible for the kids during that time. But it sounds like it's the variable nature of what your clients are asking of you. In my case, this is kids. I just, I'm just uh, trying to suggest other variants of what people can be facing in that regard. Yeah. When you don't have like predictable hours of work, but you have work to be done. Yeah. I, <laughs> I think you have to make it predictable a little bit. Even if you are planning to work or are predicting to work after your children are in bed or kind of knowing that there's a lot of flexibility in your schedule and you can respond when you need to, but that there are certain times that I, I know from my own anxiety, I need to know that I have some little piece of time carved out where I can respond to things. Okay, I think that makes it. Thanks very much. Thank you.